Hello there, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. I, as always, am your host Simon. In today's episode, the Dial of Pass incident, what happens here if you're new, our writer for this channel, Kel, I say R, it's some giant operation. My writer for this channel, Katie, writes me a script. I'm going to read it, and then afterwards, Jen, our wonderful video editor, adds some music and some images. If you're watching, if you're thinking, images, Simon, what are you talking about? This is a podcast. Well, it's also available on YouTube, isn't it? So if you want to see the pictures that go along with today's episode, which aren't necessary, because of course, as always, I will paint a beautiful picture in your mind, head on over to YouTube and check it out. Look, before we get started, if you're watching this, make sure you give a thumbs up, make sure you're subscribed if you're listening as a podcast. Subscribe, leave a review, five stars, except maybe four, because you'd be like, why doesn't it get started sooner? That's not important. Let's just jump into today's episode. Gruesome deaths, strange lights in the sky, government cover-ups. If that sounds like an episode of The X-Files, you're not far wrong. However, this strange case occurred in real life in Russia in 1959. I recently found out that The X-Files had returned. I don't know how I didn't discover this or anything like that, but uh, I've got two seasons of The X-Files to catch up on. I heard that The X-Files were still being filmed, and I was like, what? I saw last saw the X Files twenty years ago, and didn't Mulder and Scully go off and do whole other bigger projects? And now they're back making the X Files, and it's exciting. What has made it even more tantalizing throughout the years is that while there are theories galore as to what happened to the nine young hikers caught up in this strange event, there's not one theory to rule them all. Nothing so far has adequately explained all the elements in the case. This is not one for the weak of stomach, because we're talking about the Dyatlov Pass incident. And with that Dyatlov Pass incident, I will just say, I know there's going to be lots of Russian pronunciations in here, which I'm I'm just going to do terribly wrong. I'm so sorry, but I'm too lazy to look them up. And also, I just, <laughs> it sounds really bad, but I just like sitting here and reading the script and having a good time <laughs> and looking up the pronunciations is a bit too much like work. <laughs> oh my God, let's just carry on the mystery. In early February 1959, a group of nine hikers led by Igor Dyatlov were camping on the side of a mountain in the northern Ural region of Russia. Is it just a coincidence that his name is Dyatlov and he was in the Dyatlov Pass, or was it named after him? Uh, well, I guess we're going to find out. This was not necessarily the best place for them to pitch their tents, but darkness was fast approaching and they had a big day of climbing plans for the next day. During the night, an event occurred which sent the campers scrambling from their tent in a mad panic, ripping it open from the inside to get out. Their bodies were found over a series of many weeks, some with no obvious sign of injury, others with huge trauma to their chests and heads. Two people had missing eyeballs, one had a missing tongue. They were not dressed for winter in the Russian mountains. Rather, they were all wearing items of each other's clothing, and some were in little more than underwear when they were found. Two of the hikers had high levels of radiation on their clothes, others had burns on their bodies. What in the living heck could have happened to cause these experienced people to flee into the night and then come to a horrible, grisly end? Around the time of the events, other hikers and local people had described seeing lights in the sky. The last photograph taken from one of the Dyatlov group's cameras is a blurry image of what looks like at least two lights hovering about in the night. There were rumors that one or more of the group were working for the KGB. The hikers were in range of a military base, which only added to the conspiracy theories. In May 1959, less than four months after the tragic events, the case on the Dyatlov Pass incident was closed. Blame was handed off to Igor Dyatlov for camping in a dangerous area, and the official explanation given to cover up the entire weird manners of death was this, quote, It is concluded that the cause of their demise was overwhelming force which the hikers were not able to overcome. <laughs> That's not an explanation. That's just a statement of what happened. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was hit really hard. Yeah, but by who? Why? Again, come on. What? Is this? It's not. That's not. That's that. No. Uh, excuse me. Could you be a little more vague there, please? What kind of overwhelming force are we talking about? A natural one, like an avalanche, or a violent one, like an animal, or a human attack, or maybe an extraterrestrial force, the flipping force from Star Wars. 
Also, calling it the Dyatlov Pass incident seems to tone down the whole thing a bit. An incident sounds fairly benign, or like a title from a Victorian detective story. How about the Dyatlov Pass mass killing event? Let's get into the details then here. A lot of them ain't pretty, but it's mainly because of the range of weird injuries that the hikers sustained that this case has kept the public's attention for the last six decades. I mean, I'm vaguely familiar with Dyatlov, so I, d I worry that I'm going to spoil bits of it. But I mean, so trauma and stuff can be, you know, what, avalanche, animal attack, stuff like that. What really I don't think I've ever heard explained properly is why was there radiation on their clothes? Like high levels of radiation? That is super bizarre. The lights on the camera and stuff and the KGB and the military base. I'm like, all right, yeah, maybe it was a military thing. Definitely wasn't aliens. <laughs> no way it wasn't the aliens. The History on the 23rd of January 1959, a group of 10 people, 8 men and 2 women, set off for what they were expecting to be a challenging but rewarding hiking and skiing trip up the Ural Mountains. They had all completed many hikes and treks before and were all considered to be more than capable of finishing this expedition. In the time before cell phones and quick communication, they told friends and family they expected to arrive back at Vizhe, a very small town, by February the 12th. And that was that. Nothing was expected to go wrong, and if it did, the party was large enough and contained at least one person with experience as a medic to be able to sort things out on their own. The people in what's become known as the Dyatlov group were as follows. Leader of the group, 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov. It's kind of weird they have a leader. Like if I, I, I often go hiking and camping with my friends, I don't know, five or six of us. We don't have a designated leader, because <laughs> we're not in the scouts, we're not 12. We're just like, what are we doing? We're going hiking. Are we going to have to make any complicated decisions which we need to defer to a leader on? No, we're going hiking. That's it. Simple. I will just point out that the Dialogue Pass was so named after the, spoiler alert, tragic events that befell the party. It wasn't as though Igor Dyatlov said, Hey guys, let's go for a hike over in the Urals. I'll let you check out my pass. The Dyatlov Pass is located near, but not exactly in the area where the bodies were found. Dyatlov was studying radio engineering at UPI, the Ural Polytechnic Institute, as it was known at the time. Next, Yuri Doroshenko, a 21-year-old radio engineering student. Ludmina Dub... Binina, the youngest of the group at 20 years old, she was studying engineering and economics. Alexander Kolyevatov, a 24-year-old physics student. Zinaida Kolomogorov, a 22-year-old radio engineering student who had hiked extensively with Dyatlov. This is, seems to be a group of very smart people. <laughs> Yuri Krivonishenko, a 23-year-old construction graduate who had been part of the crew to clean up after the 1957 Kishtim nuclear disaster. Rustam Slobodin, a 23-year-old graduate of UPI with a fondness for long-distance running. Nikolai Thybo-Brignoli, a 23-year-old civil engineer. Simon Semyon Zolotaryov, the man the old man of the group at 37. He was a late and mysterious addition to the party. He died on his 38th birthday. And finally, Yuri Yudin, the only surviving member of the group. He was unable to carry on due to problems with sciatica. They, that left nine people in the Dyatlov party. He was probably like, oh my god, <laughs> I'm really glad that I went away from the crazy eye-eating radiation situation. The remaining nine carried on with the trip, hiking, skiing, taking photos, and writing in various diaries. The group dynamic seemed fine, with no one mentioning particular tensions over leadership or romantic rivalry of any kind. The weather was noted in the group diary as being around minus 16 degrees Celsius during the day, 3.2 Fahrenheit, dropping to around minus 26 centigrade, minus 14.8 degrees Fahrenheit at night. That is bloody cold. <laughs> oh my god. You've got to be Russian to want to go hiking in that, right? Yes, it was cold. Katie and I, same page. The last entry in the group diary is the 31st of January 1959. In it, Dyatlov notes that the weather had closed in and that they're making slow progress at a rate of about one mile an hour. They're extremely tired, but managed to make camp in front of the forest, ready to push on to the mountains the next day. The last part of the entry reads, quote, We're exhausted, but start setting up for the night. Firewood is scarce, mostly damp furs. We build the campfire on the logs, too tired to dig a fire pit. Dinner's in the tent nice and warm. Can't imagine such comfort on the ridge with howling wind outside, hundreds of kilometers away from human settlements. This is the area where the now-named Dyatlov Pass is situated. This camping sounds miserable. I, I, those camping trips I take with my friends, sometimes we go in the winter, 
a couple of times. I don't really go anymore just because I'm doing this for fun. And I get there and I'm just like, it's bloody freezing. It's cold in the night. Even with a four season sleeping bag, the first time I forgot my bloody roll mat, you know, the thing you sleep on. And it was so, so cold just on the ground. The next night I just cut down loads of uh, bracken, not bracken, it's, it was winter, like a uh, fir tree, like little fir tree branches and put them down underneath me to keep me off the ground. And that made it better. But then I was like, why am I going camping in winter? There's like a meter of snow. I just don't want to do this. So I, I don't camp in winter anymore because I'm a big adult man. I can make my own decisions. <laughs> On the 1st of February, the group left some of their belongings behind to make it easier to climb the mountain and also have a stash of provisions for the return leg. It's then theorized that they went a bit off course on their trek and decided to pitch their tent on the north slope of the mountainside rather than having to backtrack however far and then to do the route again the next day. The mountain they camped on was Kolat Syachal, which has been translated as Dead Mountain or Mountain of the Dead from the native Mansi language. <laughs> Sounds like a brilliant place to camp. While this is a creepy foreshadowing, the definition is really more like meager or lack of game, i.e. not a place that's going to kill you, just a place that's not great for hunting. The Dialov group's target climb was Mount Otterton. This has similarly become known as meaning don't go there. Warning for people just to stay the heck away. This might be another mistranslation, however, and the name might actually refer to a different mountain further away in the Urals. The apparent Mansi name for the mountain, referred to as Ototon, actually translates as mountain with swirling winds, which doesn't really fit into the whole death omen narrative, so it has been ignored for the more obvious monikers. That night, something happened which left all the hikers dead, which has never been fully explained. We'll go into the theories in a minute, but first, let's talk about how the bodies were found. I, I, I'm regretting having my lunch immediately before recording this episode because. The eye removal. The it's just this isn't gonna be a good time, is it? As previously mentioned, the group wasn't expected back until February the twelfth. When Yuri Yudin had to leave them due to illness, Dialov told him that actually they'd be back on the fifteenth instead. After a few more miscommunications, bad weather, and desperate attempts from family and friends to find out where they were, a search party was eventually sent out on February the 21st, which was obviously far too late to rescue anyone. Datlov also hadn't filed a copy of the route they were taking anywhere, so that made it even harder for searchers to locate the party. It wasn't until five days later, on February the 26th, that a group from the rescue party found the Dyatlov group's tent. The front of the tent was propped open, but the rest was covered in snow. It was not particularly deep, and it was deemed at the time to have just been a natural accumulation of windblown snow. Searchers recovered nine backpacks, coats, pants, shoes, boots, skis, hats, blankets, foods, papers, a stove, and axe. Basically everything a group would have needed to survive in the mountains in the winter. Yeah, finding that, you're like, dudes, it's like minus 26 degrees outside and we found your coat. Yeah, you're, you're not alive anymore. The tent had holes and was ripped in a way that looked like maybe someone had cut their way in. It was only after later analysis that it was determined that the cuts were made from inside the tent, pointing to the hikers having cut their way out in a great hurry. There were photographs taken of several sets of footprints heading away from the tent. One of the rescue party noted, There were footprints of bare feet, but in socks. Some were from Valenki, soft felt boots, and occasionally we could make out the tread of a ski boot. All of these prints were raised higher than the actual wind-scoured surface of the slope. We followed these prints from the tent in the direction of a spreading cedar, which was clearly prominent on the hill. First we lost, then we found the tracks again. They appeared again in the birch tree undergrowth, and then they went down along the ravine, which led to the Lozva River. From what rescuers noted at the time, the tracks that these footprints made seemed quite orderly and not evidence of the group sprinting out haphazardly into the night. I don't know, although leaving your tent an in urgency it, you cutting yourself out of your tent is a pretty urgent statement it's like no 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 i couldn't i couldn't do the zipper <laughs> Whoosh, just ripping it right open and then casually walking away seems like a bit of a contradiction the only conclusions the rescue party could draw was that someone or something had forced the Dyatlov group to leave their tent in the dark, practically taking nothing with them. They had headed for the forest and not the supplies they had left the previous day, and they never returned to the tent. This is so creepy. <laughs> The first bodies were found on February the 27th, almost a month after the actual event took place. Under the prominent cedar tree noted by the search party about a mile from the tent were Yuri Doroshenko and Yuri Krivonoshenko. It looked as if they 
They built a fire, but it hadn't been enough. They had practically no clothes on and burns to their feet. An investigation of the cedar tree found traces of human flesh several meters up, perhaps indicating that they had scrambled up the tree to get away from something. Doroshenko also had a burn on his head and foam on his cheek, possibly caused by pressure to his chest. Oh my god, this is... I don't remember... Like, I'm familiar with the Dyatlov Pass incident. I think it's come up in videos that I've made before, but only very briefly. I had no idea about this being chased by something and the burns on the feet and the like climbing up the tree to escape. That is so intense. Krivonoshenko had apparently bitten off a piece of his own knuckle. Good lord. Yes, this gets a whole lot grimmer, so if you're already wrinkling your nose up, prepare yourself for a whole lot of grossness. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I do another podcast called The Casual Criminalist, which, uh, well, there's been beheadings on Greyhound buses and people eating hearts and children serial killers. So, you know, my, my stomach has become a bit leathery having been through that traumatic experience of a podcast. So, but I mean, eating your own knuckle, pretty intense. Neither man was wearing shoes or a jacket. They were lying next to each other when found, as it looked as if one or both had been moved post-mortem. Their cause of death was given as hypothermia. Later that same day, bodies of Zineda Kolmogorova and Igor Dyatlov were discovered. Dyatlov was found a few hundred meters from the cedar tree, wearing ski pants, a shirt, and a sweater, but no hat and, again, no shoes. He had some minor facial injuries, but he had bruising on the knuckles of both hands, similar to what you might get if you're in a fist fight and you punch someone really hard. He also had injuries on both ankles. His skin was described in the report as bluish red. He was found lying with his head toward the tent, perhaps indicating that he was trying to climb back up the slope when he died. His watch had stopped at 5.31. Kolomoga Rover was found under 50 centimeters, that's 20 inches of snow, by a search dog. She was about 630 meters, that's 2,066 feet, from the cedar tree and the nearest body to the tent. She was also found with her head towards the tent as if trying to get back to it. Of the first four bodies found, she was the best dressed, wearing several layers but still no shoes. This episode is so creepy <laughs> that I'm like in my dark office. It's the middle of the day, but it's dark in here and I'm looking around, being like, ah, oh, there's monsters. I don't like it. Oh. <laughs> she had some facial and hand injuries similar to Dialov, and her skin was noted as being purple red. Further investigations also found a huge bruise on her side, like she'd been hit hard with a bat or a baton. The cause of death for these two was also given as hypothermia. Oh my god, there is a lot to explain. And I get, you know, we're obviously not going to come to a conclusion because Katie said right at the start that this is not, uh, is still not explained to this very day. But I'm sure people have attempted it, and I'm truly curious how, like, all of this random stuff is, like, explained. I feel like it's got to be multiple things, because the people, like, escaping the tent and the radiation and stuff, this has all got to be a series of events, right, rather than one global thing, because that's just more likely. But, I mean, it's a lot to explain, right? Despite search teams searching the area meticulously after these finds, it wasn't until March the 5th, another week later, that the next member of the group was found. Russ Demslobodin was found between Dialov and Kolomogorova, also lying with his head in the direction of the tent. Because of the way the ice had melted under him, the search party concluded that he'd been alive and warm when he lay down, and for whatever reason, he just didn't get up again. He had four pairs of socks on and a couple of layers of sweaters and trousers, making him the best dressed of the group so far. He was also considered the strongest of the party, meaning that he would be expected to keep going longer unless something happened to impair him. This might be explained by the huge fracture to his skull. Slobodin also had wounds to his arms and bruising on his leg. His watch had stopped at 8.45 a.m. His cause of death? Hypothermia. If you're wondering why it took the search party so long to find anybody, it's because they were basically completely blind. Any visible footprints stopped at a certain point, snow had fallen constantly, and the search didn't even start until weeks after the reaper died, so they were completely hidden from view. Yeah, that woman was like 50 centimeters of snow above her. A dog had to find her. Searchers used metal detectors, but none of the Datlov group had any significant amounts of metal on them to make using them worthwhile. In the end, they just had to fan out and use rods to poke down into the snow until they hit the ground or something else. They did this every 50 centimeters, 20 inches, over a huge area, with no real idea where to look. Most of the volunteers were students, friends of the Datlov group, desperately hoping to find their friends safe and sound. One of the search party detailed how tough it was in his report. Quote, Every day we worked in deep snow, at least knee-deep, but often waist-deep. 
so we worked very slowly and for many hours per day testing with the three meter probes sometimes when our probes touched something and we thought we'd found a body we would dig feverishly with full power shovels and hands but the snow would fall back finally we'd find something oh shit, it's a tree trunk we'd start again because of the difficulty of the search another two months went by before the final group of body was found on may the 5th a trail of cut branches was noticed and eventually a small den or shelter was uncovered the remaining four hikers had cut branches and piled clothes on them to form makeshift seats off the snow there were a few other items near the den but the knife used to cut the branches was never found about 20 meters 66 feet on by a stream they found the body of ludmilla de benina under about four meters of snow that's 13 feet she was also on her knees upright against a rock with her head facing upstream she had damage to her face with significant amounts of soft tissue missing her eyeballs were completely gone as was her tongue she had broken ribs on both sides of her chest her cause of death was given as hemorrhage following the chest fractures and internal bleeding she was wearing a brown sweater which later tested positive for radiation i feel like the the, the missing eyes and the missing flesh on the face has got to be animals right like the person died and then the animals come and did their thing lovely Semyon Zolotaryov was next to be discovered, right next to Alexander Kalevatov, and appeared to be in a position of protection around the younger man. Zolotaryov was wearing quite a lot of clothes and also had a camera around his neck. There was a deep wound on the back of his head, and his eyeballs were also missing. He had crushed ribs on the right side of his chest. Kolovatov also had major trauma around the eye area and some major trauma around the eye area. <laughs> oh my god yeah he's missing his eyes wasn't he and an open wound behind one ear his neck is reported as deformed but i'm not sure if that means broken or crushed either way not a good thing to happen to a neck his skin color was noted as gray green with a tinge of purple because he'd been lying in the water for so long his hands and feet were decaying part of his clothing tested positive for radiation his official cause of death was given as hypothermia the final person in the group to be found was Nikolai Thabobrignol. Like Zolotaryov, he was quite well dressed and was wearing a pair of soft boots that the hikers put on when they were in the tent. He had suffered a massive temporal skull fracture and had also got an injury on one arm. For some reason, he was wearing two watches, one of which had stopped at 8.14 and the other which had stopped at 8.39. These last four hikers were all found very close together, and despite the broken bones they had, there were no outside signs of damage in those areas, like bruising or tissue damage to the chest. It was later reported that the force needed to cause these types of injuries would be the equivalent of being hit by a car which definitely implies an avalanche right like a giant fast moving bit of snow that can hit you with the speed of a car or more it's also of note that the last four autopsies seem to have been reported in far less detail than the previous five de benina's tongue is just noted as missing and left at that for example <laughs> guys for one of the biggest mysteries ever you could have at least done proper autopsies although they didn't really seem very keen on investigating it did they what was it they said at the beginning it's like yeah it was caused by something they definitely died it's like thank you thank you so much great information as you'd expect after the long slog to recover the bodies and the subsequent autopsies and radiation testing on them there would be a thorough official report to try and get to the bottom of the whole strange affair right well no on the 28th of may 1959 just over three weeks after the final bodies were found the conclusion to the case by junior justice counselor lev ivanov was typed up on just four pieces of paper and submitted as closed so let's just recap the official explanation here and this is a quote considering the absence of external injuries to the bodies or signs of a fight the presence of all valuables of the group and also taking into account the conclusion of the medical examinations for the causes of deaths of the hikers it is concluded that the cause of death was overwhelming force which the hikers were not able to overcome it's absurd to say this this makes no sense and also considering the absence of external injuries are you joking they just had injuries their eyes and tongues were missing they got they look they had the force of a car so we've got nine dead people various different types of injuries radiation mixed up clothing so what the heck happens here oh my god so many theories you could probably have a whole series on the theories alone to call some of them a can of worms is a bit of an understatement it's like opening a can of worms and then having those worms fall out into more cans at infinitum we're going to go down some weird rabbit holes so strap in and remember that it can't possibly be all of them or can it it might be easier to get the older ones out of the way first and for once aliens are not one of the other theories but cryptids are 
Yes, perennial mischief maker the Yeti makes a guest cameo in the Dyatlov Pass incidents. It's not aliens, it's got to be the Yeti, a creature that doesn't exist. It's like the abominable snowman, what's that other one? The, uh, there's the, there's the Mexican one, the Chupacabra. What's that one in the, in the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest that I'm totally blanking on the name for? Is it Yeti? No, Bigfoot, of course, Bigfoot. Also not real. Like that video, it's just a man in a gorilla suit, isn't it? There wasn't there even a dude who came out later and was like, yeah, I was the man in the gorilla suit. People were like, no, you weren't. <laughs> even though I thought he could prove it somehow or something. It doesn't matter. It's just not real, is it? Was it a yeti or some other large beast roaming around the Russian wilderness? I think we can cross this particular cryptid off the list, even though the Dyatlov group actually mentioned it themselves in a group newsletter they created during the trip. Although the original copy of the Evening Ototan had been lost, there was apparently a brief paragraph saying something like, From now on, we know the snowmen exist. According to recent reports, yetis live in northern Urals near Mount Ototan. There was also a photograph recovered from one of the group's cameras showing a large figure coming out from behind a tree. The missing tongue of Ludmilla de Benina also gave this theory credence, as why else would that be missing apart from that a yeti ripped it out and ate it? I don't know, that some other animal ripped it out and ate it? Some other animal that we know for a fact exists rather than some cryptid? The paper the group made was just a fun satirical news leaflet, not a scientific journal. The photo of the Yeti just looks like one of the group wearing full-on winter clothes, standing a little awkwardly next to a tree. I'm obviously no Yeti expert, but I've never heard that they particularly like tongues, and if they do, why stop at one? Sorry, Snowman, I don't think you're responsible for this one. The Mansi. What is a Mansi? If ever there was an easy target, the local Mansi people were it. Ah, these are the people with the, the, the language that there was something, wasn't there? I did keep track of that. Sure, blame the indigenous locals and their unfamiliar religious practices for the horribly grisly end of nine young Russians. There's no evidence that the Mansi tribe were in any way involved in the Dartlov group's deaths. The area the group were hiking in was not considered sacred or forbidden in any way, and it was not unusual for hiking groups to have perfectly cordial interactions with the Mansi. No crimes had commi been committed in the area, and the Mansi did not have a confrontational or violent reputation. None of the diaries note any worries or misgivings about the local people, and the evidence left behind pretty much does away with any credible motive. Why would the group be attacked and then everything be left untouched? Nothing seemed to have been taken from the tent and there were plenty of things that would have been useful for people living in cold conditions. There were also gems, watches, matches and other things left on the bodies that seemed to rule out an attack for personal gain. Ah yes, when I go robbing bodies I take gems, watches and matches. The footprints leading out of the tent were easily followed, at least to begin with. There wasn't a sign of a large number of people present, and if the Mansi were the culprits, surely they would have used their know-how to hide the bodies better instead of just leaving them where they fell. They also aided in the search for the hikers and used their own dogs to help discover the bodies. I know that it's a trope that killers will involve themselves in the search for their victims, but this doesn't really seem to be the case here. Yeah, and I feel like the killers searching for their victims is like that rare example of it happening and then people are like whoa so they think it happens more than it does so these it wasn't these people <laughs> what about other human involvement then a psychotic murderer maybe an escaped prisoner or two there was a prison camp a few miles away from the group's final camping site so there was the possibility of criminal involvement except remember this was on a mountainside in the middle of a russian winter yet also they got hit with the force of a car there's an escaped prisoner with a car in the mountains that can drive on the mountains? Just no. If anyone had escaped and there were no recordings of this having happened at the time, they wouldn't be in a fit state to take on nine strong hikers by the time they'd reached the camp. Injuries to some of the hikers' hands might coincide with having punched something, maybe a person, but at this point, it's just not possible to tell. Also of note, however grim, is that none of the bodies had any signs of sexual assault, another strike against an attack by people. And again, the fact that many useful and valuable things were left behind seems to close the door on any sort of attack by random criminals. Animal attack. 
Picture the scene. You're setting up to cook a nice meal for your buddies on the mountainside when all of a sudden a wild animal, maybe a large wolverine, comes leaping out of the forest at you. It charges the tent, starts ripping it to shreds, and in its panic it unleashes its smelly spray stinking up the place. Everyone calmly gathers a few bits and bobs and heads off to give the animal some space and let the stench clear. Okay, sounds vaguely reasonable. It might even explain why the hikers left the tent in the first place. But then what? They all split up, fell over enough to give themselves skull fractures, and died? There's no way an animal attack even begins to explain their deaths. So, well, next. I don't think we can rule out, like, animal attack post-mortem, though. Like the eating of the eyes and the tongues, and the mutilation, some of the damage. Again, I'm assuming it happened post-mortem. The actual post-mortems weren't very useful, or we didn't get much information about them, so... If their tongues were ripped out where they were when they were alive, it'd be a bit different. But I just think it's like scavenging animals. Some sort of mania. There are a couple of different theories suggesting that the group was basically off its face and everyone wandered around in a disorientated state until they all killed each other or fell down the ravine and died. The first culprit for this state is what's known as Arctic Hysteria. As the name suggests, the cold conditions induce some sort of hysterical reaction, which can be passed around the group leading to confusion and ultimately their death. This hysteria only appears to affect native tribes though, i.e. people living constantly in that environment. The Datlock group were very experienced hikers, had plenty of warm clothes and supplies, and were just passing through. It seems unlikely that they'd fall prey to this sort of thing. Also, none of these so far explain that radiation or a bunch of other stuff that I'm sure I've forgotten. It's pretty intense. Another strand of this theory is methanol poisoning. Maybe somehow the group ingested methanol that was meant for the stove and a few hours later it made them all blind and disoriented. In their panic, they all ran away and met with various grim fates. While poisoning might explain why they left the tent, that's about it. The fact that one of the group managed to make a makeshift shelter after leaving the tent and another had made a fire shows that they must have been thinking somewhat coherently. There is also no evidence that the group used anything other than wood for their stove. Also, I feel like if we'd done the autopsies properly, then we'd know about the methanol thing. I'm pretty sure that would come up on some blood work or some such. So what about magic mushrooms, or shrooms, as they're irritatingly called? Could some or all of the group have knowingly or unknowingly taken some sort of hallucinogen and ended up throwing all of their clothes off? Or was it a person or persons unknown who were on a drug-fueled killing spree in the Datlov group were in the wrong place at the wrong time? Now, it's not totally beyond the realm of possibility. In a book by Svetlana Os called Don't Go There, she speculates that another indigenous tribe called the Kanti were under the influence of fly agaric mushrooms and had stalked and attacked the dialogue group, kicking Rust and Slobodin in the head and causing the chest injuries to the others by kicking or jumping on them. Ouch. The previously mentioned Yeti photo could instead be one of the group capturing evidence of someone following them, which might explain why they didn't camp in the forest as they were worried about this other tribe. While some things can be explained by this mushroom theory, it doesn't explain how other members of the group might have died or why nothing was taken. Don't forget about that radiation too, where the group was attacked by drug-fueled loons or took the drugs themselves. It wouldn't have caused anybody to be radioactive. Yeah, none of this stuff would so far. The radiation is one of the biggest mystery ones. I'd feel like they were like physicists, right? They were radio engineers. Maybe at the university, like a couple of them would have been involved with like radiation somehow and their coats had been contaminated prior to going hiking because I can't see how you're going to get irradiated out in the wilderness, right? And can they date when that radiation started? Probably not. Remember how the correct translation for Mount Ototon is supposedly mountain with swirling winds? Well, maybe this is relevant after all. There is a natural phenomenon known as catabatic wind or descending wind. It's also known as gravity wind, and it can occur in mountains or over glaciers. Basically, a strong wind can roll downhill at huge speeds, wreaking havoc in its path. In places like Antarctica, catabatic winds are fairly common. They spring up out of nowhere and can quickly reach speeds of 15 to 20 meters or 50 to 66 feet per second. That is a mega wind. This could be a reason why the group hurriedly left their tent, and it might even explain why some of it was covered in snow if they quickly heaped some on top of it to stop it from blowing away. I don't know, if I was worried about my tent from blowing away, because there's super strong winds, I feel like the most sensible thing to do would be to get in the bloody tent and weigh it down with my body, and that way I'm also not in the crazy wind.
If they were caught in hurricane force winds, this might also explain the trauma to their bodies if they were thrown or fell against rocks or were hit by flying objects. Yeah, that makes sense. Perhaps the strong winds also triggered a slab avalanche which finished off the rest of the hikers. Such rare events are almost impossible to reconstruct, but on the face of it, it's a credible theory if you ignore some of the other injuries such as the burns and why the backpacks and other contents of the tent were all still close by and not flung around everywhere. Ah, and now we enter major conspiracy theory territory. So enter at your own risk. Oh no, the conspiracy theories begin. Here we go. KGB special forces and other undercover shenanigans. This whole take thing takes place in Soviet Russia during the Cold War. That alone should have you reading the official reports with a liberal sprinkling of salt, but some elements of this case just smack of a cover-up. It has been posited that at least two members of the group were working for the KGB and using the trip to carry out some sort of secret mission, maybe to find some pesky CIA agents hiding in the wilderness. Yes, <laughs> seems likely. Remember that hastily added member, Semyon Zolotaryov? He had a shadowy past involving the military and sported cryptic tattoos that nobody could work out the meaning of. This might not mean anything, though. I've read enough tattoo mistake clickbait articles to know that a lot of tats are not particularly significant to the wearer. Yeah, <laughs> those favorite ones are where someone gets like a Chinese symbol, like from the. Oh god, what's the Chinese alphabet called? I don't remember, but it's like it doesn't make any sense. And there's the translation. <laughs> it's like, oh no, what have you done? His identity has been subject to debate over the years, and he was even exhumed in 2018 to check if he was who people thought he was. Turns out, he wasn't. While the skull in his grave matched known photographs of Zolotarov, a DNA test from a private lab showed no matches to his sister's daughter, leading people to wonder if the real Zolotaryov had been rescued by his KGB handlers and some other body planted in his grave. A further DNA test carried out by the Russian Center of Forensic Expertise, however, did find that DNA from the body of Zolotaryov's grave matched that of his niece. That's confusing. How can DNA be so different and so wrong? Are the two like different parts of the same body buried in that grave? This is weird and worrying. So maybe I should recant my previous statement. The story doesn't quite end there, though. The way the DNA was collected means that it could potentially have come from another family member. Zolotaryov's brother disappeared during the Second World War, leading some people to speculate that it was actually his body that was buried, leaving Special Agent Semyon Zolotaryov free and clear. Wow, so this was... That genuinely sounds like a super shady KGB way to cover up someone's death so they can go off and live some other life like putting the brother's body in the grave instead that is intense alexander kovatov has also been tapped as a potential kgb agent his source of income didn't really match the average wage a young science grad could normally expect and he had been given a work placement in a secretive ministry department straight out of university the theory goes that the undercover agents were meant to deliver radioactive samples to the cia but things went horribly wrong leading to the deaths of the entire dyatlov group it was also theorized that Dialov Group accidentally came across a group of special forces soldiers and were killed by them. Remember the deformed neck of Alexander Kolovatov? He also had an injury behind his ear. A blow to that area, plus a neck snap, is a special forces calling card. As previously mentioned, though, the whole group's autopsy reports were oddly light on detail, so we can't say for sure that these were his actual injuries. It's also been noted that it looked like Yuri Doroshenko, the first hiker found, had foam on his cheek, which may have been caused by a pulmonary edema by someone, i.e. special forces, putting pressure on his chest. While you can fall down a dark spiral where this all seems perfectly credible, and I have to say right now, I'm like, this is it. The special forces did it. I mean, the guy, the two guys who potentially work for the CIA, the radiation, the... I don't know, this, the, 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 the autopsy's not being done properly, and you know, I'm sure they're done by the government in the USSR. It's all like, it's all very shady, isn't it? However, we have to remember that all the members of the group left the tent. Something then happened which prevented them from returning and either caused or led to their subsequent injuries and deaths over a period of at least several hours and possibly longer. A group of military agents attacking them doesn't really fit the scenario, although it's not the last time shadowy government involvement will pop up. Lights in the Sky Okay, so was it our extraterrestrial friends paying a visit? Ah. Uh, always a familiar one when it comes to the conspiracy theories strange lights had appeared in the sky in the area with other hiking groups in other parts of the mountains confirming their appearance around the time of the dyatlov group's deaths the mansi tribe had drawings of orbs in the sky and thanks to the launch of sputnik in 1957 interest in all things spacey and ufoe were to quite high point 
There was also an intriguing photo, the last on the roll taken by one of the groups showing at least two blurry lights. This theory states that weird lights were appearing in the sky. The group left the tent in a huge rush to capture photographic evidence and then whatever happens, happens. Ah, uh, they were in a huge rush. Who is like, I'm going to see, I see some lights in the sky. I really want to go take a photo of them. So I'm going to cut my tent open so I can get out faster. I don't think that ever happens. You'll just be like, oh, I missed the lights in the sky, didn't I? That's a shame. And at least my tent isn't ruined. Were they attacked by an alien craft? There were trees in the forest that were burned at the tops, maybe by some sort of precision heat-seeking ray. Some of the hikers sustained burns, a strange injury on a snowy mountainside. And the lead investigator, Dev Ivanov, was actually told to remove all mention of unidentified flying objects from his report. In his later years, he said, quote, When E.P. Maslenikov and I examined the scene in May, we found that some young pine trees at the edge of the forest had burn marks, but those marks did not have a concentric form or some other pattern. There was no epicenter. This once again confirms that heated beams of a strong but completely unknown, at least to us, energy were directing their firepower towards specific objects, in this case, people acting selectively. I'm not thinking it's aliens, I'm thinking wasn't there a weird secret military base nearby? I mean, directed energy weapons are a thing, right? They use those powerful lasers. I mean, I know this was the 1950s, but secret military bases. So if even the lead investigator was convinced these lights had something to do with it, what other explanations could there be for them? It might be worth pointing out here that while the photo of the blurry lights fits with this theory well, other people have said that the photo was not the last to be taken by the group, but rather the first to be taken in the lab when the photos were being developed. The shutter was half open, meaning that to remove the film, the technician had to take a photo to advance the film and open the camera. The blurry lights were therefore just some lights in the lab. That's a disappointingly boring explanation, though, so let's stick with the UFO lights one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like the conspiracy theorists have done for the last 60 years, I'm sure. Anyway, back to what else might have caused the lights. There is a phenomenon called ball lightning, which is, funnily enough, a ball of lightning. It's pretty rare, but can last for several seconds and can even move around quite near to the ground. One theory is that atmospheric conditions caused ball lightning to appear near the Dyatlov group's tent. They all pegged it outside and waited for it to pass, but it didn't, and several people fell victim to close proximity electrocution by lightning strike. The victims by the cedar tree did have burns and injuries that could be explained by a lightning strike. The lightning strikes could also have created an explosion in the ravine, accounting for the blunt force trauma that the group in the den suffered. So, is this it? A plausible, if statistically rare, explanation? Well, it's not really possible to say definitively, as there are too many other threads to too many other theories. The radiation found on two of the victims is still perplexing, as is the time frame with the hikers dying over a period of hours, if not a day or more. And there is one other theory that links to the lights in the sky, and that's rocket launchers. Does anybody smell a nuclear test launch gone wrong? A subsequent government cover-up? I absolutely didn't, and I'm thinking, okay, radiation, there's a lot of trauma, the burns, okay, but then the whole area would be hugely radioactive. It's not like two people's coats or whatever it was, or was it two of the people? They're going to be radioactive and no one else is. I mean, I'm pretty sure nuclear blasts cover a large area with radiation, not just like a really small place. If your nostrils are twitching, this is the theory for you. There were no official rocket tests on the 1st or 2nd of February. Allegedly. Evidence exists of a radiogram sent to the search party making mention of a meteorological rocket that was sent uh, that was seen in Ivedel, about 100 miles, 160 kilometers away on the 1st of February, that was also observed separately by a different group. It was suggested in the radiogram that the Dyatlov group had made the fatal error of leaving their tent to see what was going on in the sky because of this rocket. We can now expand on that theory by suggesting that either the military killed them for having accidentally seen some secret testing going on or their campsite was bombed maybe by accident maybe not the group in the den in particular had injuries that could be explained by being caught up in an explosion and maybe the radiation found on their clothes came from a nuke after the military realized their oopsie the scene was carefully staged before the search team came in hiding any evidence of military involvement you had me a rocket explosion but staging of the aftermath not so much. Why leave everything in such a state as to arouse more confusion and suspicion in the future? Yeah, if you did the military and you're covering up some sort of rocket blast that went wrong, cover it up properly. You'd do a proper job and you'd get rid of the bodies and no one would ever know. They'd just have disappeared and that would be that, wouldn't it? It would have been the least effective cover-up of all time as we're still talking about it 60 years later. Exactly. 
There are many other theories relating to the case, from other atmospheric phenomena to death by snowmobile, but let's end it on a slightly anticlimactic note. Avalanche When you hear that a group of hikers who had camped on the side of a mountain had cut their way out of a tent in a panic and ended up in a ravine further down the mountain, the first thing that probably springs to your mind is avalanche. Yeah, I mean, cutting yourself out of a tent is leaving with urgency. If your tent is being whisked away by an avalanche or you hear an avalanche coming, you need to get out of that tent ASAP, whip out that knife and just cut yourself out. They heard the noise or were in the process of being buried in the tent, so they scrambled to get out and were carried away, sustaining horrible injuries and later dying of them as a result. The theory does seem to be the flavor du jour as the Dyatlov case was reopened in 2018. In 2020, the official report was that yes, an avalanche was to blame. Perhaps triggered by the activity of the group themselves, a slab avalanche took out the tent and forced the group to take shelter in the ravine. From there, they failed to survive their injuries and the freezing conditions and eventually all died. This is a neat theory. It also has a lot of holes. Why were the frozen footprints the search party found so orderly if the group were fleeing for their lives? Why was there a flashlight found on top of the snow by the tent and not buried under it? Was it left there accidentally by the government agency stages after they moved the tent to make it look like the hikers had just picked a really bad place to pitch it? How unlucky was it that this happened in an otherwise non-avalanche prone area? Although we keep referring to the mountainside, the slope the hikers on was not not actually that steep, so how deadly could a local avalanche be? How do you account for the burns and some of the victims? How out a group of nine very experienced hikers could not even one person escape the avalanche or make it back to campsite? Why didn't Ivanov mention the possibility of an avalanche in his closing report instead of leaving it so vague? Loose ends. If you've been wondering about the mixed up clothing and the fact that some people were found with not much on, there there are, yeah, various theories about it. Sure, friends let friends borrow a pair of woolly socks or a spare sweater now and then, but every single member of the group was sporting at least one item from someone else. One explanation is that they were suffering from hypothermia, and a contradictory side effect of freezing to death is that you start to feel very hot, and it's not unusual to find people who have removed their clothes in very inclement conditions. Yeah, I've heard of this. It sounds so crazy, but apparently it's true. Like, you get so cold, and then you're like, oh my god, it's so hot, and then you take off your clothes and die sooner. If you're ever freezing to death, don't suddenly think that you're really hot. You're not. Leave your clothes on. It's also probably because some of the group died significantly earlier than others. The two men found under the cedar are largely agreed upon to have been the first to die, with surviving members of the group moving them to a more respectful position before pillaging their clothes in order to keep themselves alive. As other members died, their clothes were taken by the remaining hikers and so on. The group of four that were found last had time to dig out a makeshift den and use branches to create something to sit on off the snow, so whatever occurred did not kill everyone instantaneously. Now, nah, come on. You didn't think I was going to forget about those missing eyes and tongues, did you? No, nah, I mean, I definitely didn't, and I assume we're going to address it. It's wild animals eating after the body. Right? I mean, what else could it be? While being very creepy and weird, it's maybe not that difficult to explain. The bodies had missing eyes. Ludmilla Dubnina, and possible KGB agent for all the good it did him, Semyon Zolotaryov, were found right by a stream. They also weren't found until months after the incident happened, which is long enough time to be in contact with running water. The bodies were noted as decaying when they were found, so it's pretty likely that any soft tissue would be rotting away, and eyeballs would be either fair game for the local fauna, or maybe they just rot and fell out by themselves. So, yeah, I mean, they are sort of the a big, liquidy, soft part of your body, which is probably going to decompose fast, right? The tongue might have gone the same way. Domnina was positioned with water running over, over her head, so it might just have rotted off. She could have also bitten through it if she'd been flung against something due to an explosion or a fall through the snow. Oh, that is nasty. Or yes, aliens could have removed it for their own nefarious purposes. No, they did it! The autopsy report gave zero detail about the tongue, apart from that it was missing. Sensational reports have said that there was blood in her stomach, meaning that she was alive when the tongue went missing or was removed, but this has been challenged as being a mucosal mass and not blood. So think what you like about that, but in my opinion, if you've suffered facial injuries and have been dead for months with your head under running water, you're lucky to have much of a face left at all. Yeah, I don't, there's nothing mysterious about the eyes and tongue. It's just human decay or animals or something boring. It's been months. Of course your eyeballs are going to get all fucked up. 
And what are the weird skin colors variously being gray, green, brown, purple, and purple, red in the autopsy reports? Mikhail Sharavin, who was one of the first people to find the bodies of the hikers by the cedar tree, described seeing that their feet and hands were reddish brown. Igor Dyatlov's mother said she had trouble recognizing him at his funeral and that his hair had been gray. These colors may be due to frostbite, or maybe they were just flash burns from being caught in an explosion. Or maybe the real Dyatlov had been killed in a secret military operation and this was the body of an older person used in his place. Or, you know, maybe not. Or maybe it was due to something else. I mean, who really knows at this point? This is such a big mystery. I mean, I do really think that it was some sort of avalanche or something like that, and then all the other stuff is just explained away by a series of coincidences, like animals eating the eyes, the people having radiation on their clothes from beforehand, this kind of stuff. The the lights being the lab lights. It's all explainable. It's just altogether it's weird. The other remaining standout thing is, of course, the radiation on the clothing. Why were the clothes even tested for radiation in the first place? Is this routine for what he's found on a mountain? Whatever. Radiation was detected on a sweater Dubnina was wearing. She of the missing tongue and eyes, and on the sweater and ski pants of Alexander Kolvatov, who was the guy with the deformed neck. These two were both found in close proximity near the makeshift den they'd created. It's interesting to note that even after being exposed to running water for a few months, the radiation level in the clothes was still significant. Was it something in the water then? Unlikely, as neither of the other two hikers found in the same spot had any trace on their clothes. Also, the sweater Dibnina was wearing was not hers. When while it was not formally identified during the investigation, it's been speculated that it belonged to Yuri Krivonoshenko. If you recall, and I'd be impressed if you did, it was several thousand words ago. <laughs> Krivonoshenko had worked in a nuclear facility and was involved in the cleanup after the Krishtim nuclear accident. Now, I don't know how easy it is to get a lot of radiation on your jumper and for it to still be significantly radioactive two years later. Radiation lasts a long time, though, right? That's kind of radiation's thing. But at least that's kind of a reason for his clothes to have traces on them. As for why Kolovatov's clothes also tested positive, apparently he and Krivonoshenko had previously trekked in a site known to have been contaminated by the Christian explosion on more than one occasion, so maybe that's how they picked up such high amounts of radiation. Or maybe they were smuggling radioactive samples to the CIA in an undercover operation of some sort. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> no, if you're guessing that, it's less likely than the radiation from somewhere else ex theory your guess isn't as good so there you have it a mystery that everybody has an opinion on but nobody can explain every aspect of while it can't be everything maybe it was a combination of things like a wayward rocket exploded by the camp which also set off an avalanche hey now that i mentioned that that does seem like a plausible theory newsflash i guess we've cracked the case or like when i mentioned this to my daughter she immediately suggested a murderer broke into the tent and set a radioactive animal on the ground <laughs> This is exactly the sort of thing a kid would come up with. Just, like, explain it all away, but in the most ridiculous way possible. Oh, yeah, maybe I should keep a closer eye on what she's watching on YouTube. Yes, Katie, you should. I know a YouTuber. I, I could recommend someone. <laughs> now there's a giant granite memorial to the nine dead hikers at the pass that's been named after them, and the Dyatlov Pass incident, with its wide range of tantalizing clues and theories, will remain one of those weird, unknown events that keeps history interesting. And on that note, I do hope you found today's video interesting. Ah, uh, I, I mean, I like the ones where we get to the end and it's like nice wrapped up in a bow with a solution. But it is also interesting to just speculate about the ones that have no answer. Look, if you enjoyed this show, please do give it a thumbs up below. If you're watching it on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. If you're enjoying the podcast version of it, uh, leave a review. That would be amazing. I truly appreciate that. Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, we love it. It's uh, five stars preferred, of course. But if you think it deserves a one star or two star, that's okay. It just hurts my soul. Thank you for watching. <laughs>